We're continuing on tonight in our study of uh, uh, the names and uh, and the titles of Jesus Christ, and um, there's quite a few of them. I think now it's up to 250. I think that uh, uh, <laughs> that you can find more about Jesus uh, and His name and titles than any other person in human history. What I want to do is go back to our reading last week that we had and talk just a minute about that lesson, and then move into the next. Uh, the next name or next title, actually, of Jesus. Let's begin reading here in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered or overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light uh, light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, though the world through the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who do, did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him, and he cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of the full, his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ and is in closest relationship with the Father, he made him known. Okay, last week uh, we talked about the, the uh, name uh, of Jesus, one of the names of Jesus, and that is uh, the one that John used here, the Word, the Word, and uh, how that, that was actually the Logos in the Greek of God. And we talked about really how that the Holy Spirit uh, enabled John to go ahead and go and take that Greek thinking about uh, the Logos uh, that goes all the way back to the beginning of science. Science asking the question, what is the reason for this? And, and, and why is this behaving the way it is? And what is the reason for everything? To open up your eyes and to see and to ask those questions. That's what true, real science is all about. And then to take that Logos from the Greek and then go on over to the Hebrew and take the personification of uh, the word, the Logos, and that is turning it into a person. And so the Holy Spirit took that and put it together. And therefore, John said, uh, Jesus, the Logos of God, the word of God, and that he, Jesus, is the reason why for everything. He's the reason why. That's what Logos means. He's the reason why. The world wonders why is everything like it is and why is the world like it is and all the creation and where is it going and all these questions that the world has. And the answer is the one that Christians know. And that is, he's the reason why for everything. Colossians 1, 16, it says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. God created it uh, through Jesus, gave it to Jesus as a gift. It's his, and someday he's coming back uh, to get it. And everything is about that everything. And that's the Logos. Now, you know, in John chapter one, I was thinking about, well, where am I going next? Okay. You know, and then I saw so many names for Jesus, right? And titles in this one chapter. Look, there's about 13 different names for Jesus in this one chapter, John chapter one. 
And so I started looking at it and reading the text over and over again. And, and, and then it started coming to me, you know, like, okay, this is what you're going to talk about, you know, and that's the way it happens with me sometime. And so I started looking at Jesus, the word, the logos, and then I started seeing this association with light, how that he speaks about, he is the light that has come into the world. John wasn't the light, he's the light. John testified about the light, but he's the light. And then this connection between light and life, that he is the light of the world, which is life in that light and, and truth in that, in that light. And those three things connected together. And I guess I could have put salvation right in the middle uh, of that triangle there. But I just got to thinking about it and reading in the Greek and the Hebrew and, and all those different words and how they were connected together. And I said, no, this is what I'm going to talk about, Jesus, the light of the world. And so that's uh, how I came to our, our uh, title tonight. And that's what we're going to talk about, Jesus, the light of the world. There's no question about it. The Bible is extremely clear when it says that God is light. In fact, uh, it says in 1 John 1 and 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And not only did John say that, it said throughout the Old Testament that God is light. In Psalms, I like this, Psalms 36 and 9, it says, for with you is the fountain of life. There's that connection. In your light, we see light. You know, I mean, it's just everywhere, all over the, the, the New Testament. And this idea of God being light and Jesus then being the light of the world or the light which is God and the light which is the Messiah, uh, it starts from the beginning of the Bible and continues all the way through, okay? Uh, and it starts really with the very first words of the Bible. Uh, and as you, as you look at that, uh, it, you know, I was looking at light itself and studying, trying what I could see about light, a lot of interesting things about it. You know, we, we can't see all of light. We only see a portion of it, but some animals and bugs see more of light than we do. That's interesting. But not only that, uh, space does not have any light. There's no light in space. The only reason we can see things in outer space is because they reflect light, okay? And therefore, we, we can see them. And that, I thought, well, you know, that really agrees with the very first uh, verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the water. And so everything was dark. Everything was black. There was no light. And then God said, let there be light. And light had within it the energy of life. You see, light gives us light, life. Light is used by plants to, to convert the energy that comes from the light of the sun into oxygen. It's the very fact that we can breathe and that we're alive on this planet is because of light. And when you think about that, God just never does anything by accident. In the Hebrew, there's no word for coincidence, okay? <laughs> it's not a coincidence, these things about light, light uh, are what they are. God is going to use these things to teach us, just like he does everything, you know, just like he does the creation of man or man and woman, or marriage, or the family. All of that was created by a design that God to give us a picture of what he and his son uh, are like and what they mean to the world. So God created the first light, you know, and like I said, nothing is a coincidence with God. Everything can be traced back to Jesus. And as I studied Jesus and, and, and life itself in the son, for instance, I thought, well, what a, what a comparison, you know? What a comparison to God is light because the sun, it gives us warmth. It gives us life. It gives us uh, everything that we need to live uh, on this planet. Without it, we would all die. And yet, if you get too close to it, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> you die. And so we find in the, in the Bible in 1 Timothy 6, 16, and he, that's God, alone is immortal and dwells in unapproachable light, 
Not one has ever seen him, nor can anyone see him. To him be honor and dominion for uh, eternal dominion for forever. Amen. And so uh, he is unapproachable. But last week, as we said, Jesus came to be a mirror of him, to show us him and the light of the world. And so we can understand that, you know. And so in him, that's Jesus, John said, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness was not able to overcome it. And throughout the scriptures, you know, you follow that just that light from the flaming sword that was in the garden, uh, the Shekinah glory of God that was keeping them all out. And you start following it down to God as his own people, his own nation in the world to be a light for him, okay? And uh, then he comes to be with them. And how does he come to be with them? He comes to be with them in the Shekinah glory, right? And he comes to Moses first in the burning bush, the Shekinah glory of God. And he speaks to him from that energy of, 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 of fire that burns but doesn't burn up. And then he's with them in the crossing of the Red Sea so that uh, God can destroy the enemies against uh, Israel and, and destroy all those that, that came after it. And then he takes them to Mount Sinai and the, and the cloud, the glory of God is there surrounding that mountain so much so what? That if anyone touched it, even an animal touched the base of that mountain when God was there, they were instantly stoned to death or told to be stoned to death. No one could approach God, uh, not until Jesus anyway. And so that, that glory was up there. And then God, you know, being with them uh, in the tabernacle and having the uh, Shekinah glory of God on the mercy seat of God, okay? His presence being uh, given inside that uh, glory of God, that Shekinah glory. And then over the top was the cloud that covered them during the day that had the glory of God in it. And then at night, they had fire, the fire of the glory of God over the tabernacle. And so whenever the glory of God would move forward, the light of God, then they were to break down the tents and to move. And when it stopped, they were building back the tents again. And then inside the tabernacle itself, they had that, and they had the, um, the candlestick that we'll talk about uh, later. But throughout the Old Testament, we have, we, we've been promised of, uh, uh, of a great light that was coming into the world and the world... Uh, and would push back all the darkness of the world. And so uh, not only was there physical examples of God as light, but there was the prophecies concerning the coming of the light of God into the world, that the darkness couldn't overcome it. And so you have these prophecies, most of them, a lot of them in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter nine, it says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, those who dwell in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. Then again, in, in Psalms 49, it says, God says uh, in relation to Messiah, the servant of the Lord, he said, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation might reach the end of the earth. And then again, in Isaiah 60, he says, arise for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord Jehovah, that's capital L-O-R-D, okay, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, you guys know what that means, will arise upon you and the glory will be seen upon you. And so what happened is after the prophets, the last prophet, uh, Malachi spoke, 400 years of silence, 400 years where God spoke not a word, did not one miracle, had no presentation of his light and his glory that they could see. And then all of a sudden, one day, <laughs> one day there was a baby that was born. And, the, and John said, in the beginning was the, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word dwelt is literally the word tabernacled. He tabernacled with us. 
Inside him was the glory. Uh, Jesus, the light of the world. In John 1 and 18, it says, not one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. That's Jesus, the reason for everything, the Logos. He has made him known. And in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, Paul said, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness. That's Isaiah. That God who spoke in Genesis 1, when he said, let there be light, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. How? In the face of Jesus, the Logos, the Word. And so he walked around, you know, uh, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God veiled in human flesh. And as he walked around, they didn't really know what he was. And then one day he took three people. Do you remember who they were? Three people, three of his disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John, the writer of the Gospel of John. He took them up to a mountain. And there on the top of that mountain, the Bible says that he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Their spirit was there with him. Okay. And uh, Peter said to Jesus, it is good for us uh, to be here. If, if, if you wish, I'll put up three, uh, should be tabernacles in the Greek. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud, that's the Shekinah glory of God, covered them or overshadowed them. And the voice from the cloud said, this is my son I love with him. I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And that blazing Shekinah glory of God came out of Jesus so strong that every part of his body and even his clothes just glowed, shined forth the light to represent who he really was, that he was God. You remember we were talking about just a minute ago inside the tabernacle. And inside the tabernacle, uh, they had the Holy of Holies and the Shekinah glory rested there, but they had a curtain over that. Now there were no windows inside the tabernacle, okay? There was no way, it was dark in there. So they had a candelabra, okay? The, uh, they called it uh, uh, memora, menorah. Menorah, ora is the word for light, okay? And so they had the menorah and the priest had to come in and take care of it all the time and make sure it was going. And that was their ministry, some of their, their ministry just to keep that light going, okay? And then there was a great feast. And this great feast was the feast of the tabernacles. And they had these menorahs that were huge candelabra. And they had them in front of the, the temple, right in the temple, the woman's court. They had them over. They say at night that they, they were so big and so many of them that the light shone like spotlights going up into the air. And there, everybody would see that. It was it's a, an amazing sight. And it was then that Jesus spoke to the Pharisees again. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and will never walk in darkness. Now you are testifying on your own behalf. What you say proves nothing. No. Even though I do testify on my own behalf, what I say is true. Because I know where I came from and where I'm going. You do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You make judgments in a purely human way. I pass judgment on no one. But if I were to do so, my judgment would be true. Because I am not alone in this. The Father who sent me is with me. It is written in your law that when two witnesses agree, what they say is true. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me also testifies on my behalf. Where is your Father? Jesus said all this as he taught in the temple, in the room where the offering boxes were placed. And no one arrested him, because his hour had not come. I 
will go whether you will look for me. But you will die in your sins. You cannot go where I am going. He says that we cannot go where he is going. Does this mean that he will kill him, sir? You belong to this world here below. But I come from above. You are from this world, but I am not from this world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins. And you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am who I am. John chapter 8 uh, for a lot of reasons. But I, I, I think one of the reasons why I like it is because uh, it doesn't, in the English, mess with the name of God like some of the other verses in English do. You know, Sylvan and I were having this discussion about the fact that, you know, the Jews never would say, you know, God's name, Yahweh, yod heh vav heh they wouldn't say it because they were so superstitious. And so they didn't say it, and then they changed it to Lord, capital L-O-R-D, or God, capital G-O-D, or Yah, uh, as, as the scriptures in, in the prophecies say about Jesus. And yet that same force is with us today. When you read your Bibles, I want you to read it from now on. Every time Jesus says, I am and you see a squiggly he that the English writers decided we need to put he in here. In other words, it's not in the Greek, but they just, they didn't know. They didn't understand. So they, so they put he in every time they say it. When Jesus said, uh, I say unto you, unless you believe I am Yahweh, I am, you will die in your sins. They had to put he in there. I am he. You say, but I like it for another reason. I, I like John 8 because it, it, you see really what true darkness really is. You know, sometimes when we're studying the scripture, the only way to really understand what something is, is to see what it isn't. You know, if you see what it isn't, then you can understand what, what it is. And then you, when he says, I am the light of the world, you can understand that. But what is darkness? Well, you know, the, the first thought about darkness is what? that it's, you know, evil, right? Sin and all that. And darkness is sin. But, but it's a particular kind of sin of darkness that the prophets were talking about. And it's the sin here of un unbelief. That's the darkness that was in the world. Now, when it comes to unbelief, there are two kinds of unbelief. There's an unbelief where, where people just don't know the truth. They just don't know it. You know, when I was in jail teaching, a lot of them come in there, they just don't know the truth, you know. And sometimes these people have hope because when they learn about Jesus, they begin to follow Jesus and they begin to, 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 to follow the light. And, and those people are all around us today. And, and that's why Jesus said that, that the, the Bible says that Jesus, the light has come into the world. And then Jesus looked at us and says, and now you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. What light? The light of Jesus. Let it shine out of you. The glory of the Father. Give the Father the glory. And if you do that, then what will happen? Then, uh, then people will, who don't believe will believe. You know, because there are lots of people who would believe if they only knew. If they only knew. That's a different kind of believer. 
you know, in, in Revelation, uh, remember the, the, the picture that we have that, of what John saw, you know, and he turned around and he saw uh, a, a picture of seven golden lampstands or menorahs, okay? And, and someone like the Son of Man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with golden sash around his ch chest. And, and the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing fire, and his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And that's what he saw. Now those menorahs there represented what? They represented the church. For the church is not a building, it's us. We are the church, okay? And it represents the church in, 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 in the midst of the world, a world of darkness, okay? And that's why Jesus said, unless you repent to that one church, I'll take away your lampstand. I'll take away the glory that you have from God. And then, uh, you know, you, you read like Philippians 2. Uh, he says that we are uh, so, uh, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among who you appear as lights in the world. And you see that, I think that's really neat that he says that there because today we do have all the darkness of sin around us. We have blindness. We have injustice and oppression. We have hopelessness and despair and cruelty and moral insanity and hatred and broken lives and broken homes and broken relationships. There's a lot of darkness. Sometimes there's even darkness in our own hearts in little places in our hearts. We know the darkness is all of there, always there. But there's another darkness, and this darkness is even much deeper. And that darkness is willful and deliberate unbelief. Willful and deliberate unbelief. This is deadly. It's the kind of unbelief that the religious leaders had in Jesus' day. These are the ones that the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelieving, the Bible says. They choose to work against the light, to do everything they can against the light. These are the ones who have heard the facts but choose not to believe. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Uh, they knew what he was talking about. Those Jews in that feast, they knew the Messiah would be the light. They knew that God is the light. And when he said, I am Yahweh, Jehovah, I am the light of the world, they knew exactly what he was saying. And you know, I think it's interesting of where it was that that happened in that Feast of the Tabernacle where they had all of those menorahs out there. And it was also a great time for the Jewish family, you know, to get together like we do with campers and stuff and, and all go and camp out right around the temple. And as they camp out around the temple, lighting all these little lights, you know, and then here's Jesus. And he's walking and he's looking and he says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. They're ooing and eyeing over these little candles and those candelabras and the blazing light of the glory of God was walking around in their midst. That's amazing to me. That's absolutely amazing. They knew Isaiah's prophecy, okay? They knew all about that. And when he said, I'm the light of the world, that was very, very, very powerful. Uh, and what he was saying also, too, is, you know, these lights that you're lighting here, they're, they're going to go out. They're going to go out. And when they go out, you'll be in darkness. Okay? He said, but whoever believes in me will never be in darkness. Because I'll not just lead you to the promised land like I once did when I was in the wilderness with you. I'll lead you all the way to heaven and eternal life. Because I know the way out of darkness. I know the way out of sin. I know the way out of sorrow. I know the way out of death itself. Believe in me and follow me and you'll have eternal life. And that's what he would say. That's what he would say. Uh, it's powerful, powerful when you think about it. Now, let me, let me go on, move on here. I don't want to keep you all night here. Uh, but 
in John chapter one, let's go back to John chapter one for a second, okay? Because I want to get this another connection, and it's this connection that I think when you get a hold of it, it's really powerful. And that is this connection between uh, the light and the glory of God, okay? The light, Jesus was the light, uh, but he was also the glory of God. And those two things together are very important. In fact, if I had to entitle and give you a title for the entire book of, of uh, Epistle of John and, and, and the Gospel of John, it would be the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Because he said more about that than any other writer ever said concerning the light of uh, who Jesus is. Now, let's talk about this glory of God for a second. The glory of God. God is zealous for his glory. And as we've seen, he declared it in the heavens. He declared it uh, when he created the lights in the sky and the stars. When he created day and night. And day and night are a witness to his glory. And they have a glory of their own. So in the light of day... You have the warmth and you have uh, the light and you have, it enlivens you, okay, okay? But then you have a light at night too. What's the light at night? The light at night is, is the moon, okay? But the moon, however, is not its own light. It gives testimony to the light. The moon gives testimony to the light. And God, again, created it that way on purpose, it wasn't a, a, a just, oh, I think I'll create it like this today. You know, no, no, no. It was all one single purpose because it was John who, by inspiration, des describes Jesus as the light, the light that shines in the darkness. Now, he talks about John uh, the baptizer, okay? And uh, when he's talking about John the baptizer, uh, he's likened John to the moon. Okay, uh, that reflects the glory of the sun, S-U-N, okay, or S-O-N, too. But, but one is the source of the light, and the other gives off the glory of the light. And I think that really helps me to understand a lot about myself and my brethren as well. Because brethren, how do you measure the greatness of, of a man or woman of God. How do you measure the greatness of a man or woman of God? Their capacity to glorify God. I mean, we have a lot of ways of evaluating people, okay, and evaluating their worth or their accomplishments, but the Bible signifies those who glorify God the best are the greatest in God's eyes. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 11 and 11, truly I tell you among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Why was he such a great man? Because throughout the ages, from the beginning, it's always been God uses those people who he can feel safe in putting his glory in their hands, that they'll protect it, that they'll, that they'll let it shine, that they'll, they'll emit it to other people. Now, here's the temptation that every one of us face, and it's a temptation for me as well, and I know I've sinned this way. The thing that robs God of his glory is idolatry. Idolatry robs God of his glory. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of idolatry it is whether it's a stone or a wooden statue uh, or whether it's the human heart, whether it's public or whether it's private. Sometimes you can take the glory of God and, and, and use it and then take, take the glory yourself. You know, it's like somebody who always talks about themselves when they're talking to somebody else. It's always about them. I've been guilty of that. I talk about myself way too much. Sylvia will gladly admit my sin <laughs> on that. But it's true. And, and I know that. And, I, and you have to be so careful about that, okay? Uh, and, and not take that glory in. Uh, instead, uh, 
It can even be in private. It can be idolatry. It can be in the form of self-pity or jealousy or covetousness. Uh, they're expressions of idolatry, of glorifying self. And that distracts from our purpose to glorify God. But regardless of the form, it robs God of his glory. God's glory was never more safe in the hands of any human being than it was in the hands of John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist reflected the glory of Jesus Christ. He was very careful to always do that and to always point to Jesus. Everything he did was pointing to Jesus, you know. And we can call then John the Baptist the reflector, the reflector of the glory of Jesus Christ, just like the moon is a reflector of the sun. Now, John is a great name. <laughs> it's a good name. What does it mean? Jehovah is gracious. That's what it means. Jehovah is gracious. And John was contrast to Jesus uh, over and over again by uh, John who wrote the epistle. Jesus was in the beginning with God, but John was sent from God. Jesus was God, but John was a man. Jesus was the light, but John was a reflector of the light. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and prophets, but John terminated the prophets because he was the last prophet that ever walked the face of this earth. Besides Jesus, if you want to call Jesus a, a prophet like the Old Testament prophets. We had prophets in the New Testament, but they were not the kind of prophets that the Old Testament prophets were much, much different than that. Okay. And so that having said that, that brings it into perspective for, I think, for all of us. Uh, John, who uh, Jesus considered Jesus truly a great man, but I didn't finish that verse. Okay. When I wrote it down there, I didn't finish it. This is how the whole verse reads. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there was not seen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because he reflected the glory of God. Yet, however, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is what? Is greater than John. Why are we in the kingdom greater than John? because we have the light of the glory of God in our hearts, in our being. We know Jesus. We are saved and we have his Holy Spirit living inside of us. And that makes us greater as long as we use that. Okay. I mean, all the verses in the Bible, when you think about really this whole thing, if you're thinking about it and you read these, the verses in the Bible, all of a sudden they take on a little different meaning. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. I, I always used to think of that walking in the light. What does that mean? Well, moral purity, right? <laughs> That's how it, come out, it came out of the school. Moral purity, you better be pure. That's walking. If you get out and step out of the light and sin, then, you know. But but John went right on to say, if anyone say I had no sin, he's a liar. It's not moral purity. What is the light? The light is what makes us greater than John the Baptist, the greatest one born of a woman in the past. It is that glory of God that we hold on to and we keep going with it. And we're walking in it. And as long as that glory of God is in us and we're walking in it and it's shining forth from us, then all of our sins, again, in the Greek, that's the present continual tense of the verb, keeps on forgiving, keeps on washing away our sins. None of the sins are, are there anymore. In fact, I, I like this verse here. Jesus was the I am, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may what? Proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. That's what evangelism is all about. Evangelism is not tricking somebody into the baptistry. It's not making somebody so scared they want to come. It's having the glory of God in you and, and attracting people through Christ. Now, there's some people you won't, those who willfully don't believe, they won't be attracted. They will hate you. But other than those, you know, others will start coming to that. And what an evangelism. What if we just went out and just let the glory of God come forth from us? What a way to evangelize the world around us. God has called us not just to survive in the world, but to be the light that pushes back the darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the star out of Jacob in Numbers 24. He's the son of righteousness risen with healing in his wings, Malachi 4.2. He's the one that John saw in Revelation 1.16, whose face was like the sun shining in full strength. He's the bright and morning star, Revelation 22 and 16. But one day he will return. And there'll be one final great sunrise. And then there'll be no more sunrises. We read in Revelation 21 about a new Jerusalem. This city has no need of the sun or moon or shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the lamb, the lamb, the light of the world. And the gates of the city will never shut by day. And there will be no night. The light of the glory of God that has life inside of it will be our light. We won't even have a sun or anything like that anymore. There'll be a, a new heavens and a new earth. Now, how can you comprehend that? No, you don't have to tell me. Yes, yes. See, I had something in my head. And I said, tell me to remember this and I'll remember it when I get, because I didn't have anything written down about it. But it was just that discussion we were having, yeah, about about the I am and how many times he says it is just incredible. When he's walking on the water, and as he's walking on the water, uh, is it you, Lord? And Jesus actually just said, "I am," and got him out of the water, boat on the water. When they came to get Jesus, he said, "Yahweh." They dropped to their knees because he's calling himself God. And then finally, the way they killed him was they had him before the high priest. And the high priest, out of frustration, just says, look, art thou the Christ, the son of the living God? And Jesus looked at him and said, Yahweh, I am. And they all screamed out, blasphemy, blasphemy. You all heard it. There's no need to go any further. And it's what killed him. It's what made him take him and kill him. Because in everything, the light, the word, the truth, all of it, he was revealing he was God. And if you wanted to hear it, you could hear it. You could know it. But they didn't want it. They were in darkness. They loved the darkness more than they loved the light. Right? Light. One, one illustration. <laughs> Sometimes darkness can be very dangerous. I know of a preacher who took his son out to see the Grand Canyon. And they were out there just getting ready to look at it and everything, and it got dark. And, you know, it got dark. There's no lights out there. So it got really... Well, they decided to go over to the parking lot. He had a couple of sleeping bags. And so he said, let's just go and throw our sleeping bags down, go to sleep, and we'll get up in the morning. So they threw their sleeping down, bags down on the ground. They went to sleep. And right about a foot away was a 500-foot drop. <laughs> and they woke up, but they couldn't see it in the dark. And there's a lot worse than that for those who are in the blindness of Satan, blinded by the God of this world. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If it's been a blessing to you, you can go to johndkimbrough.com to hear more episodes. You may also subscribe to my free podcast on Apple Podcast or anywhere you listen to podcasts. You may email me at john at johndkimbrough.com for questions or comments. Thank you.